<laughs> right, are we ready now then? Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. Well, so, let's just begin. Let's, yeah, welcome everyone to the um, Wherever It Is podcast. It's the 50-something podcast, isn't it? That's five, 500th yeah. podcast. My name is Derek Watson. With me I have, in full Technicolor, Chris Ritchie, peripatetic editor and author. Meow. And uh, Richard Lishman, managing director of the Four Dentist Group, in his charmingly decorated office. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you, Richard, in the country? I'm South Wales, and it's blowing a hoolie outside. Is it? Yeah. Actually, it's quite sunny here. It's all right here. Mm, no, it's terrible. There's something going on outside, though. Sounds like a chainsaw. Or a... You get that in the country, though. People think it's nice. It's not. It's noisy and horrible and dirty. But I think we covered that last time. Yes, I think we did. So, what have you got for well, Christmas, lads? Anything exciting? Not overly. Not as exciting as your gift. Grandchild. Yeah. My gift, yes, that's right, yeah, little uh, baby Cecilia. Let's get a picture of her up on the screen. And there she is. Yeah, I don't think you can see her, but, um, well, you might be able to see her if I share the screen. Well, if, she's got, a, see her. if she's got a blue head and a blue body, then we can see her. <laughs> if she's got any hair, she might look a lot like Richard, so just stick on Richard there. She did have quite a bit of hair. Oh. Blue eyes, can you see her? Uh, yeah, see it. Nice. Yeah, she's like she's a lovely little thing. She's only um, two weeks old yesterday. She was born on the twenty second, which means yeah. that um, she's going to be one of these people that's constantly going to be um, complaining about having Christmas and birthday presents at the same time. I had a friend of mine, Ian Shepherd, at school, and he was born on the twenty seventh, and he was constantly complaining about the fact that people bought him one present that covered Christmas and his birthday and that as a result he ended up with half the worldly goods he felt he was entitled to. Yes, yeah. the entitlement. My mother's birthday is on the 27th and also my mother-in-law, um, which makes for fun times. Really? Oh, right. Yes. So I, I often get confused about which is which. Well, it is the Naturally. parents' fault, of course, isn't it? I am the same every year. It's easy. <laughs> it's pretty easy yes so uh, dentistry oh Remember? these headphones these headphones are a Christmas present oh nice we covered nice these in the uh, December Fusion uh, as a best buy and I um, more I looked into it the more I thought they were a good replacement for my old ones which I think I've had about 20 years my old uh, Sennheisers mind you they were nice but these are very nice, very light. No, seriously, my old ones I had for a long time. I don't know what's happened to them now. There was nothing wrong with them, but um, they were quite heavy, you know. They had sort of, um, they were like pilot headphones. They had this sort of PVC, real closed cup things that really welded themselves onto the side of your head, which got a bit uncomfortable after a while. But these are these are closed, but um, very light, and so you can wear them. Um, I can't remember what they are. Anyway. So, that was exciting. Anyway. <laughs> and I'm a bit on the treadmill. Oh, yeah? Yeah. 157, yeah. my maximum heart rate, but I don't go much above 130. I don't want to do what that Douglas Adams did. You know him? Wrote the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Yeah. I think he got on a running machine and blew up. He did, or the machine did? No, I think he did, yeah. <laughs> I prefer the Lance Armstrong approach to exercise. Let's have a quick look. Death and Legacy. Here we are. Adams died of a heart attack on 11th of May 2001. See, I remember this. This is what, this is what worries me. Age 49 after resting from his regular workout at a private gym in California. 
he had unknowingly suffered a gradual narrowing of the coronary arteries which led at that moment to a myocardial infarction and a fatal cardiac arrhythmia. There we are. Now if you can get those down on the uh, the old board in Scrabble you're doing extremely well. <laughs> but 49, eh? Shocking, isn't it? It is. And there's well, a story in the news this week. Sometime. Yeah, I know, but 49. I mean, come on. That's young. <laughs> He's a young man. <laughs> Working this. I was just saying else. to Chris, this exercise puts a year and a half on the end of your life. I mean, it puts a year and a year and a half on your life, which they everyone assumes is on the end. But it's a shame it's not in the middle, isn't it? Which is when it would be most useful. Mm. But um, you know, when you're a year and a half away from dying, you might not appreciate another year and a half of it, mightn't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who's to Maybe say what sort helps. of state you're going to be in? in the nursing home yeah but there was definitely a story um, this week about a dentist who died who was a keen um, triathlete and um, he was uh, 58 uh, and he died and I just out of interest here we are Dr Raymond Unland Jr noticed dentist and triathlete dies at 58 so I'm thinking, here we go, there's another what's the name. But in fact he was knocked he was out on a bike ride and he was knocked over on his bike. Is that in Britain? No, no. No, I don't think anyone is called Unland, are they in Britain? <laughs> Unland. Then have you noticed how the Americans have really weird names? No, never noticed that. Have you not? Every American I've met has got some sort of really weird name. It makes you wonder how they invented them all, or whether in fact they did invent them all, you know? It makes me well, think that a lot of people who went to America just thought, oh, I'll call myself, you know, just through just threw a, a Scrabble board in the air and said, I'll have whatever name comes down. A lot of them have uh, surnames as first names, don't they? Things like Logan and Carter and all of that, which is very strange. But yeah, so that's I'll very sad. Yeah, I think I think their names are the least of their concerns. He's obviously a good guy, but yet another example of how exercise is not always good for you. Yeah, well, as I say, the Lance Armstrong approach serves me very well. Even uh, who's that British guy who won all the Olympics and Tour de France and everything? Wiggins. Wiggins. He was knocked off his bike, wasn't he? Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. It's dangerous business it riding a bike. Dangerous. Yeah. Anyway, that's enough preamble. <laughs> We've only got so long. I've only got 16 hours recording on this. So, uh, Chris, do you want to kick off with something that you said you wanted to bring up? It's a topic not well, completely I... unheard of on this podcast. Just before Christmas, as you know, I was... Um wondering how much the General Dental Council takes in, uh, you know, its income uh, annually, and I was surprised to find it's as much as £32 million. So I spent uh, maybe one or two minutes over the last couple of weeks thinking about this, and I thought maybe quite a lot of that goes towards staff, but that it's quite an alarming uh, amount of money to take in and um, you know I, I often say that the GDC is not particularly effective regulator and it doesn't doesn't do half of what it could do a lot better I think but is that a lot of money do you think you know 32 million that's a good lottery win isn't it I think it came yeah. up on GDP UK didn't it as a subject uh, a few months ago that um, they are in credit now by roughly one times their annual turnover. Okay. In other words, we could go for a year without paying anything, and they would still be able to fund their activities. And um, they were. There was a big debate about, and I think someone in particular wrote in and defended. Um, 
the GDC and said, yeah, it's, you know, wouldn't you rather have a GDC that was rolling in money than a GDC that had no money? Which is a bit of a dumb question because the answer to that is we'd rather have a GDC that has the right amount of money. Yeah, what does it spend its money on? It it um, It's all on these... Uh law cases isn't it it's all the fitness to practice stuff oh god yeah i mean the vast majority of it goes on solicitors solicitors and so, barristers fees so the gdc is effectively just propping up the uh the dental law economy oh yeah absolutely it is the dental law economy hmm. and is that necessary because i think that uh it's not it doesn't really sit right with me that the GDC should have loads of money sitting in its bank account. You know, it's, it's not there to make a profit, is it? So if it's got all this extra money, it should lower the annual retention fee, perhaps. Yeah, you think because so. it says it only it says it only takes enough money it needs to run its core functions. That's what it's always said, you know, the GDC takes as much money as it needs. That's why the annual retention fee is set at that level. So as it's clearly in rather a lot of credit, it should credit its uh, members, sorry, not members, registrants, give them some money back, should it not? Yeah, I think it should. And in fact, I've just found the... Um, I've found the um, thing on the uh, GDP UK forum, the, the thread, and it's headed uh, GDC coffers are bulging with cash. And uh, it's yeah. uh, from about August 23rd this year. Mm. It just... is difficult to refund uh, registration fees. Um, I think from a tax point of view it would be easier reducing the fees for the following year, which would make sense. Well, well, how about if they just don't charge the annual retention fee for the coming year? Mm. The downside is you can have some people that are retiring and that don't, won't be registered in that particular year. So would they then need a refund? You've got to be fair. And also people that weren't a member in the current year but will be next year, should they actually pay zero because they haven't contributed? Well, the thing, it was brought up by a chap called Alan Ongier, A-U-N-G-I-E-R, Ongier or Angier or something. And uh, he said the cash on the balance sheet is approximately 36 million, and it's been growing. And um, all that, I mean, they've purchased uh, about some, some investment securities, equities, uh, fixed income, presumably gilts, but they've got 26 million in cash. Yeah, they're refurbishing million the cash. offices, aren't they? To well, the tune of yeah, but the trouble is, million. like, <laughs> if I had thirty-six million, of which twenty-six million was in cash, I would, I would have to invent something extremely expensive to do to justify that, that didn't use it all up. Do you see my point? When you get to a point where you've got an embarrassingly large amount of cash, like if you take um, uh, British Association of Dental Nurses and all the indemnity cover they sold to their members and they were making a great deal of money out of it the underwriters were making a potload of money out of it the no nurse was getting sued or likely to get sued and so in the end they had to they had to make a very big deal of a very make a very high profile case out of a nurse getting taken before the GDC because it got to the point where it, the amount of money they were taking was getting so embarrassed they had to almost invent something to do with it and I think it's the same with the GDC. They've got 26 million, and they think, well, look, we, we're going to have to invest. We're going to have to invent something that costs about 10 million to justify what we're doing here. I mean, they, if only to build a bigger building, because the cash is going to start bursting out of the walls, <laughs> start coming out. Mm -hmm. As soon as someone opens the front door, all the all the money's going to start falling down the stairs. Well, I've got an idea. They could. Um go on a space expedition to see if there's anyone doing illegal tooth whitening out in the uh, cosmos somewhere <laughs> and that could use up 25 or so million I think 
yeah it's you know they are obviously they're sitting on a massive great cash pile aren't they because of the um the nurses i think because the nurses are don't really need regulating there are so many and there are tens and thousands of them and um uh so it's a bit that the old dem plan thing you've got your your patients are all sort of divided into um categories a to e where a is very healthy e is dental disaster area most of the patients are in c but although the, the patients in e pay a lot more putting their subscription up a pound makes no difference at all um putting up the band c the vast majority in the middle by 10 pence will bring in far more money than than doubling the e rate so they've got this yeah. situation where the nurses are bringing in 120 pounds each reliably and by putting that up to 130 or even 125 they're going to get far more money than they would if they put the dentists up from 500 to 900 this pile of money is only going to go up isn't it yes no it's an obscene it's an obscene pile of cash for them to be sitting on absolutely um but i don't know what's to stop them i mean the, the gdc is all about empire building isn't it and getting as many people into registration as possible is uh their objective and getting as much money out of them as possible and sitting on it is also their objective so <laughs> And at the end of the but day, they're only um, they're only keep holding a spreadsheet, and a, and a lot of the disciplinary stuff is only, you know, is is just a big uh, trough for the lawyers, and uh, is c maintained, you know, is carried on in a way which is grossly inefficient, um, because that's grossly inefficient for the GDC is grossly efficient for the lawyers in terms of their fees. And yeah. uh, you know a lot of um, complaints that which could be knocked on the head by a more sort of a proactive uh, stance early on, and certainly by far more arbitration uh, rather than this sort of courtroom drama that we have played out in the GDC at the moment. Um, uh, but there's no incentive for them to do that because why? Why, why would they do it? You know, that would just mean the end of all their fat fees. So of course, you know, they. Um, they have advisors and legal advisors have advisors and the whole thing is is shocking i did an analysis i think on what they took home and there isn't a hearing that they have that uh, costs less than 10 grand even the simplest mm. hearing yeah well i'm off to take the bar exam well <laughs> Even you know, well, there are bad. lawyers who are trying to get into the GDC. I mean, I have been approached on more than one occasion by uh, someone who's doing a bit of dental work, and says to me, "Look, Derek, you know, how do I how do I get into this GDC?" Um, and what they do is they swap, don't they? They have like one year capsticks acts for the GDC, and then they put it out to tender, and someone else gets the contract, mm. and then capsticks acts on behalf of the medical defense union and dental protection or whatever or anyone who's um, a defendant and then next year they all swaps around again so they all take turns at being the GDC solicitor and, uh, it is a bit of a you, you can't get into it unless you're you know you're you you have to be invited to get into it I think mm. cronyism then Old boys club. Just a, it's just a very specialist market that, and I think they put as much work into developing, you know, into their own interests as they do into the clients. Okay. Anyway, well, we, everyone knows that we don't like the GDC and we moan about it. <laughs> so that's how, that's how free weekly moan about the GDC. Well, no, I have another another topic on the GDC. Yeah, go on then. Um, is this uh, one I emailed to you guys a few weeks ago that uh, at the dental technician we asked the GDC why they don't um, seek to prosecute dentists who use illegal technicians and their answer was we don't have the powers to seize documents which is a very woolly cop-out answer 
because all along they've said any registrant using uh, someone who isn't registered who should be puts their own registration at risk mm. but so far there's been no evidence whatsoever of them following through on that and dentists who are using unregistered technicians are uh, you know in my opinion the, uh, the you know committing the bigger crime than the unregistered technicians because they are you know knowingly using the services of people who have no comeback really because they're not registered you know they know that they they could be making anything their materials are not uh, you know going through presumably the same rigorous process but you know what the point is the GDC is uh, effectively creating double standards there when it shouldn't be and completely getting away with it but we know so that, I mean, dentists have... that would include overseas uh, tax as well I guess Chris yeah, well, there there is a loophole that uh, a dentist can use anyone overseas, but the dentist uh, who fits the appliance takes overall responsibility. And in fact, that is the same here. If you use a UK registered technician, the dentist still takes responsibility overall. But that so, that was always the case, though, wasn't it? I mean, that was the case that before technicians were registered the dentist used to take overall responsibility for whatever was fitted in the patient's mouth and you couldn't trust the technician to you know if he sent you back something that was silver you couldn't have it assayed yourself it's all very well saying patients can't have stuff assayed but the dentist couldn't either and if it was silver you never knew whether it was platinum palladium silver or nickel uh, you had to trust your technician but because you had a long-term working relationship with him and he was obviously after repeat business. Um, there was um, there was not much. I would say there was probably not much abuse. But um, if a, a dentist wants to carry on on that basis, that he accepts that he would he he's going going to be uh, in front of a firing squad uh, if it's found out that he's decided to um, uh, accept responsibility in, on behalf of an unregistered technician. I can't see how that's worse than being unregistered which is what the technician is he's just he's just said given a middle finger to the GDC hasn't he yeah exactly but the, the technician he's is the one who's prosecuted the dentist is left alone is that right well I think I don't know you see I'm not I don't have the figures in terms of prosecutions but I do know that a dentist could be prosecuted for that the GDC is always saying that uh, you you lay yourself open to um, prosecution if you cover for someone who is unregistered. Yeah, well, it's um, it is uh, as I said before, it's a big double standard. They say that they will uh, uphold all of their policies, but they don't. So they they are letting dentists get away with something which they are saying is a criminal act. It must be difficult to police, though, Chris. I don't see how. They say that they can't seize documents, but if you prosecute, uh, you know, they go after these tooth whitening salons, beauty salons, they go after them off their own backs, and these aren't always from complaints from the public, are they? These, these are, they find out that someone's doing tooth whitening, and they shouldn't be, and they go after them. So how is it different that they find out a dentist is using an unregistered technician? It may be that if they're not regulated, then they don't have the powers to do so. Within the FCA, the Financial Conduct um, uh, Authority, we're in a position where the FCA can come in at any time and see documents. They can do whatever they like. They are the gods of the financial world. Now, we're obviously regulated. If there was another financial firm that wasn't regulated, I imagine that they, the FCA, who don't actually police what they do, even though they're acting illegally, it's probably not the FS FCA, it's probably the, the police themselves, or a different, different department within the government. And I imagine that's very similar with the, uh, the GDC, what they can and can't do. 
Okay. So why do they have a policy saying that the dentist using an unregistered technician um, is also at fault and risks their own registration? If they can't enforce it, what's well, the point in even saying it? They're probably trying to make sure that dentists complete their own due diligence with the, the labs and techs that they're actually working with. Hmm. So it's there's actually, but there's, there's no disincentive then for a, you know, a dentist to use a unregistered technician. They can just do it and get away with it, while the technician cops the prosecution. I guess if if a complaint came in stating that the particular dentist was using a unauthorized lab, or if if a patient died or something terrible happened to that patient and there was an investigation carried out, then no doubt that then the GDC would complete their findings and if the dentist or the practice had been working uh, illegally, then that's when action would be taken. But unfortunately it's after the horse is bolted. Well let's just, um, there's only one more thing that we need to discuss on the old agenda. And that is make me uh, at the moment. I'm getting. Obs I'm obsessed with Bitcoin at the moment. Obsessed. <laughs> How many have you got? Was it three? You've got. I've Sorry. got a few. I've got a few more now, Richard. All right. Okay. I oh, wake up in the morning and I look at the graph and I think, got to get another one. <laughs> have you seen the graph? No. Yeah. Let me show you. Yeah, it's gone up quite a bit over the last uh, few months. How do you get a Bitcoin? Um, I can, I'll show you. It's not difficult. Um, let me just um, share the screen with you. So, yeah. so um, basically what we're looking at is uh, every one of these vertical bars is a six hour period. Um, and uh, obviously green means um, it finished up higher in that period than it did uh, in the period before. And red means it ended up lower. So. Um, this the, the middle period around about sort of end of November to middle of December was about what was when it was in the press and um, it got China it's being being used to move a lot of Chinese money out of China so the the old the Chinese are buying bitcoins with renminbi stroke yuan and um, and shifting it out of China um, and the Chinese uh, government said that uh, Chinese banks can't deal with it can't can't trade bitcoins for Chinese money uh, and um, so it dropped in value a lot and um, then um, around about uh, where are we December 17th 18th it sort of um, it's rallied a bit again so it's now up to where it was about the 10th of December which is where it was when I sort of uh, got brought to my attention but um, since then I've learned a lo an awful lot about it and in fact what we're going to do is we're going to have a big feature on it in the um, uh, February Fusion the, the Fusion that's coming out on February the 1st because this is exactly the sort of thing that you can take in a dental practice you can accept Bitcoin in in payment in a dental practice now if you're worried about the uh, volatility of the current of, of Bitcoin then obviously you can convert it straight back into pounds but if you um, if we get to the point where you can spend it, then you won't need to convert it back into pounds. And um, and to sort of to facilitate that, um, we've decided to start accepting uh, Bitcoin in payment for the dental fusion. So how how do I I want to buy a Bitcoin? Why do I want to buy a Bitcoin? And what? how do I go about doing it and what does it do for me what's the advantage well, over normal can, currency can you see the, the site there localbitcoins.com yeah has that come up yeah yeah so what you do is uh, once you, um, you you create an account and you have to start off fairly small but you can see here they're selling bitcoins for about 605 each and this guy here, NJASHL, he's done six trades. A hundred percent of those have been positive, and he's got positive feedback. 
um, or you might prefer the Bitcoin transfer who've done 100 plus trades again with 100% feedback they're selling at 608 so um, you you get a quote for a Bitcoin which you can get from this site prwv.com and in the moment it's telling you that Bitcoin's worth about 581 um, and they're selling for 608 so you have to pay a premium it's usually about 10 percent there may be better times to buy I would say probably Monday morning's the worst time to buy because everybody gets up and resolves to buy a Bitcoin Monday morning um, Sunday nights a much better time to buy because um, nobody's <laughs> nobody wants to buy um, but literally if once you want to buy all you do is you just click on buy and you say how many uh, you want to buy and it tells you what the the, the price is and then um, click on send a trade request they then in return you get back their sort code and account number so you then using your um, using your electronic banking you then make a payment to that sort code and account number and then as soon as the uh, they confirm that the payment's been received then the Bitcoin which is held in escrow by the site is then released to you and it comes up in your account on the on this site so you can see here I've got um, 0 0.00331667 bitcoins in the account and that's because as soon as your bitcoin goes in that account you then gonna want to transfer it to your local wallet which you send um, which, which you keep on your computer so it's a bit like having a Swiss numbered bank account so you you just if anyone wants to send you anything or if you want to send anything but from one wallet to another all you need is the, just the number but in, in um, reply to your question about um, why we you know what it's all about and why should you bother with it um, the actual bitcoins themselves although they have captured the headlines because they have appreciated in value and, and therefore they've been sort of uh, you know people tend to assume that they're a speculative thing and can't understand what the value in them is the actual Bitcoin protocol itself, the, the uh, blockchain, the way that everything works is really the magic in this um, and they've solved a problem um, of double spending which with digital currency there was always a problem that you could spend the digital currency and then um, immediately spend it again so there'd be an element of double spending um, and through a rather, well through an extremely ingenious thing called the blockchain in which every transaction is recorded and subsequently built on like a brick wall so that they then become irreversible they've solved the problem of double spending which means that what we've got here is a protocol for uh, a central register a decentralized register of ownership in this case it's ownership of bitcoins but it could be anything ownership of uh, property ownership of shares anything so the the it's the protocol itself is is the genius the reason why people are finding Bitcoin useful is because it um, is what they call very low friction, which means that uh, to pay to pay with something is very very low cost. So typically, um, to pay for something that costs a hundred pounds would probably cost you about three four pence. And uh, believe it or not, to transfer a million pounds from here to America would be would also be four pence. So it's the solution to micropayments on the internet. It's a solution to a ton of stuff. The all I can say is it is it is to finance what the internet was to publishing um, all those years ago. And so much stuff's going to be built on this platform. But in order to get involved with it and to take advantage of it and use it, um, you have to own some. So and at the moment everybody's piling in and and buying some Bitcoin because um, if you don't have any, you can't take advantage of of all the things that eventually and and there's there's not much to go around there's 21 million bit in whole bitcoins now they can all be subdivided to eight decimal places so it's not as though um, you'll never be able to get some you will I mean the days when people will be able to say that they owned a whole one I think will be increasingly rare but um, uh, there, there if you think about it there's not even enough for everybody in London to have one let alone everyone in the world so to be able to and, and this is only I mean I'm not a financial advisor Richard and this is only my opinion but the yes, it's good yeah it's, uh, it's good that you embrace it and, uh, and, and purchase some yourself I mean I think the days when 
you could pick up a bitcoin for less than 500 600 quid i think we'll be we'll we'll i think in 20 30 years we'll be looking back and saying my god you know do you know it's like those people who buy houses and, and, and annoy you yeah. and say do you know what when i bought my house it was 3500 quid and <laughs> i didn't have a mortgage within two months yeah. and you're like you yeah, bastard we just don't believe it do we but i think in 30 40 years people look back and say you know my my grandfather actually owned an entire bitcoin <laughs> yeah <laughs> Couldn't well, believe I'm, I'm still not really grasping this you know so someone has invented a currency but they've only invented uh, a certain amount of it uh they haven't invented a currency so much as as a, a protocol for transferring ownership right so if you have to think back to the invention of the internet and and when people came along with this http and everyone's like well what's http and they say oh it'll only be used by porn child pornographers to send pornography around it's all entirely bad and it'll be the death of the newspaper industry and etc and you can imagine everything that's been built on http https and ftp and all this it all it all came about because everyone just agreed on the protocol for distributed low-cost full-color publishing and what's happened now is that we've someone's come up with a, a, a solution to another big problem which is how do we have an internet friendly distributed uh, low friction in other words extremely low cost world currency that doesn't that isn't centrally regulated doesn't rely on trust because the maths is all you have to trust you once you trust the maths it's not like we have to trust the bank of england or the federal reserve or the chinese government or whatever this is a completely trustless system because the maths takes care of the trust the maths is all open source anyone can look at the code it's been people have been trying to hack this for four years the cryptography that's involved is the same cryptography that's involved with credit cards and banks and spying so it's it's like if the cryptography of this is is not sound then nothing is sound so i think it's most unlikely that anyone will challenge the maths of it so for the first time if i want to send money from from me from me personally from me to someone else i can do it and i can do it in a way that which is cost me nothing in effect in fact what we've been doing we've been mucking about with this you can buy 10 pounds worth of this stuff and then transfer it from one account to another and then from that account to another account another account to that to the first account just to see how it works and it probably cost you about 10 pence there's not many other i mean if i was western union i'd be crapping myself about now yeah. Yeah, or if so, I was so, so or its Visa. main its main function then is to allow people to circumnavigate, you know, around paying bank charges. Uh, yeah, certainly it would. It is going to drastically reduce what people pay in terms of money transfer costs. Yeah. Okay. So that's but that's not the only. But I mean, it has several other. I mean, if you look at what they call the fiat uh, currencies, like the dollar and the pound. Be because governments have control over the money supply and basically they can print money uh, you know every time the government prints money it affects the the value of a pound doesn't it because the more pounds there are around the less each pound is worth so all, all and governments do print money they are they have a very long history of printing money and they we were on the gold standard until about 1971 and all the time we were on the gold standard and the price of the pound was fixed to our gold reserves we we were actually financially pretty responsible but it was because of the government's wish to print money to get itself out of its overspending in effect that uh, we came off the gold standard and since then they've just printed pound notes like they're going out of fashion and but it's uh, not is not the bitcoin also directly tied to the world's currencies you have to spend real hard money to buy bitcoin well so the, how the, no as you can see from the graph the bitcoin dollar rate is is very variable in fact at the moment it's it's very volatile so i wouldn't and bitcoin as a protocol or or the bitcoin protocol is so is so in its infancy i wouldn't recommend anyone to sell their house and buy bitcoin because you know 
we we don't know where this is going. We we you know I think personally it's got a considerable upside, um, and um, I'm not going to mention any figures. But I mean, the the all I'm going to say is that there's a considerable upside. If you want to do some reading about the Bitcoin protocol and how much a Bitcoin might be worth in two years or three years, I think you'll find there's a lot of there's a bit of pessimism and a lot of worry on behalf of the world's economists who don't quite understand it but it's almost almost like a currency that rewards you for being nerdy the more <laughs> the more nerdy you are the earlier you got into it <laughs> and then the nerds it's, it's, are going to take over the little, financial world but it's little like more than that. it's like a stock investment isn't it it's just like buying shares in something it is yeah pretty much mm, well it it behaves it's, like a stock in that it goes up and down but a stock really at the end of the day is related to the value of a particular company isn't it and it's it's underwritten by that company and the value in that company this is what so many people have their trouble getting big heads around bitcoin itself is its inherent value is in its usefulness it's what you can do with it so i went and stayed with a friend of mine in germany for the last dental exhibition and um she paid for a hotel uh and now i owe her the money for the hotel now how do I give her that money? You know, I either you lose money in the uh, I, you know, exchange. I'm going to lose. I'm going to have to pay the bank to do it. So, you know, if you imagine what Skype did for the telephone system, <laughs> and uh, or uh, what Twitter did for news, this is this financial protocol is going to do is going to have a massive impact on the world's finances. So much so that most of them are, haven't even woken up to it yet. A Bitcoin really itself is only the means to an end. It's just the way that you transact it. To be honest with you, if I'm sending a hundred pounds to someone, if we convert it into Bitcoin and out again, it doesn't make any difference how much a Bitcoin's worth. It could be worth a dollar or a million dollars. If you're converting in and out, that doesn't make any difference. If you're going to go into Bitcoin as a, a speculator, then obviously you have to do your own research and it's at your own peril. But um, as a, uh, if you step back from it a bit and look at the bigger picture and say, this what what a distributed, trustless international currency, that it where, where the money supply is not only limited but is actually predictable. We actually know how many bitcoins are in circulation, and we know how many are, will ever be in circulation. It can't be counterfeited, um, and and the other thing is that a lot of people are con concentrating on it at the moment. Is it you know it allows you to evade about ten common taxes. If I if Richard uh, if I do a favour for Richard and he pays me in Bitcoin, and then I pay my gardener in Bitcoin, and my gardener goes down the pub and buys his beer in Bitcoin, and the publican then um, uh, dies and leaves his pub to his children in Bitcoin. The HMRC are going to have a fit. Well, that's that's how it first started, wasn't it? Bitcoin through uh, illegal activities with money laundering and drug dealing and the likes. Yeah, so I think yeah. In the same way as that, the internet really grew through porn. <laughs> yeah. You know the the uh, in, in a way. I mean, obviously nobody supports that. But the the reason why it grew was because the the people who wanted to buy cannabis or whatever needed uh, an anonymous decentralized low friction trustless payment system so they invented one but it's going to be far more useful personally if if buying drugs with bitcoin cuts out a whole load of organized crime then i'm not going to be that sad <laughs> personally I'd far rather that someone bought the bought the stuff direct from the grower with Bitcoin than than ended up with a load of stuff that might possibly kill them and and uh, funds a load of organised crime right the way across the world in the middle of it. But that's just a throwaway comment, you know. But I mean, you know, okay, so it will be. And uh, but 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 look at it this way. I mean, HSBC got censored, didn't they? Censured a few months ago for uh, laundering, money laundering in South America. Um, that they, they, they were the bit. They're a big culprit in terms of money laundering. And um, how much illegal activity is funded by just straightforward cash? Hmm. That's still good. And although um, the SCA are, are working hard to make sure that uh, the government makes sure that uh, people don't use cash. 
um, because obviously that is how people learn the cash and learn the money. But again, Bitcoin is a new cash moving forward. It is so a sort of digital. I'm gonna, we're going to recommend that dentist accept this stuff because mm. it's so easy. All you do is you put a QR code, one of those little square blocky codes up. You you create an account, which you can do download. Uh, something like um, Armory to your PC you create an account you then print out a QR code you stick that up someone comes in wants to pay their bill they get their mobile phone out they get their um, Bitcoin app going on the mobile phone they scan your QR code put in how much they want to pay in pounds and not in bitcoins in pounds and that amount of Bitcoin is then transferred from them to you no no merchant services charges no um, minimum transaction fees no percentages being shaved off by mastercard or visa just a straightforward money transfer but what's going to stop the banks from getting involved in bitcoin and you know what where where is the uh, where's the take up going to come from you know you, for bitcoin to actually work you've got to look at um, the big online um, shops buying into Bitcoin or you know ha having the facility to pay with Bitcoin you've got to look at high street shops accepting Bitcoin you you it, talking about fundamentally changing the whole world's financial framework yeah absolutely you are and uh, if you look at things like Twitter to, what, what was the acceptance for Twitter? Four to five years before people started using it. Uh, yeah, Facebook, is, four to five years. This is very years. different. This is very different. It, Twitter uh, is bigger. just a, a mouthpiece for no, people uh, to absolutely. spout inane bullshit all the time. <laughs> you know, Bitcoin is uh, m money makes the world go round. Bitcoin is, you know, from what the way you're explaining it, Bitcoin is basically an entirely new way to make the world go round. Yeah. But, but I don't, I don't see it happening. You know, I understand why you have enthusiasm for it, but the whole world would have to buy into Bitcoin for it to work, and I don't think it will. Well, I don't think that. Uh, you know, I think people have a choice. They'll have a choice, won't they? Either to stick with their national fiat currency, or uh, go more into the the, the Bitcoin economy. Um, and I think yeah, I think you're absolutely right at the moment. Allow it. Well, that, that, it doesn't depend on the banks. It, mm. it, is, it <coughs> depends on the maths, and uh, it depends on the internet and encryption. And to be honest with you, that's something that the governments have, you know, they've they've had a lot of trouble uh, stopping things like uh, uh, GPG and PGP and all this. Uh, you know, th these systems are not they're international. And there are a hundred governments, and the hundred, the hundred, they've all responded in different ways. The UK government initially said that there was a luncheon voucher, and that if you yeah. bought one, whoever sold it to you should charge you twenty percent VAT on it because it was a luncheon voucher. But they, <laughs> that's the level of understanding that they've got of it at the moment, and I think that that all the time that they're they're at that level, I think that we need to work hard on. Um, you know, the, the people who do understand it, I think, need to take advantage of the fact that they are they are always a bit slow and I'm not saying that HMRC shouldn't raise tax or, or that they won't eventually find a way to possibly tax it I think they're gonna have a problem with taxing because it's so intangible because literally every payment you receive is received to a different address so tying people to addresses is is, is very very difficult um, mm. there is always a, an audit trail though, isn't there Derek well, there isn't, there isn't, yeah, absolutely right. I mean, there is by definition an audit trail. Every Bitcoin transaction that has ever happened is in the blockchain. And in fact, you download the blockchain as soon as you download some wallet software. The first thing it does, and it takes about and three hours, is it downloads the blockchain, which is a record of every transaction that's ever happened. And that's how it works out how many Bitcoins your, your, you've got is by working out where where all your bitcoins came from by working through the blockchain but in the same way as it's a swiss numbered account um, if there's no association between the the key the account that's holding the bitcoins and you personally then it, it is pretty well impossible to try and work out who owns those coins 
Mm. So, no, for example, if I had a if I had a an account which was a you know and I paid, let's say Amazon for the sake of argument started taking uh, Bitcoin, and I paid for something on Amazon and I said yeah deliver it to Perry Corner Farm, then there would be in Amazon's database at least a link between that blockchain address and my 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 home address. So you know, it's not. People think it's totally anonymous. It's not. It's only anonymous so far as you um, want to try and keep it that way. But um, it is possible for me, you know, um, if Richard, if you were say to me, you know, I want you to pay a hundred pounds to this account, I could pay that. I could pay a hundred pounds to that account, but I would have mm. no way of knowing whether that was your account or whether you it was your brother-in-law's account or your wife's yeah, account or. Uh, the Al Qaeda. Uh, you yeah, couldn't. We, you can actually register your own individual address as well, can't you? Um, not. No, it's not really massively a feature of it. In fact, they. Well, it's not a feature, but I know you can definitely do it. And well, our receiving address is on the front page of um, yeah. uh, the DPA website. So, in fact, anyone who goes goes to our front page and they they can copy our receiving address go to blockchain.info, paste in our receiving address and the blockchain info site will tell them immediately how much, how many bitcoins are in that account. Yeah. Yeah. What I'll tell you is, is zero. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because, and, and also it will tell you if any, you know, when, how many bitcoins were transferred in, on what date and also if they were taken out, they will also say when they were taken out. But when they're taken out, you, you, there's no way of knowing if they were then if they were spent by the DPA on, you know, whether they've they've been swept into my personal account or whether they've gone on uh, DPA expenses or I've given them to you, Richard, or whatever. You know, it's it's a number. You have to really really chase the numbers to get any any information. But there is actually an audit trail there. That, I think that that's the point and. There will be certain people that will just give any address, so there won't be a formal association or organisation's address. So they could turn around and say the moon as their address if they're trying to um, smuggle uh, funds or, or launder funds, etc. If they're purchasing or selling drugs, etc. Um, so I would imagine they're not going to; those individuals aren't going to provide. A particular address linked to them, they'll just make something up. Well, it can so, it can be linked to them. That's the whole point. I mean, they can have control of it. But uh, as far as the money laundering goes, the way I I see it is that um, normally when you're converting currency, and you can think of it as a currency conversion, as I am buying bitcoins with Great British pounds, at that point, at that interface where you're changing from the fiat currency to the cryptocurrency money laundering would normally dictate that you provide at that point your passport and some form of identification so the person who's selling you the bitcoins has an audit trail as to who they they were sold to but if you're if you're um, a business and you're selling your you're an agency and you're selling bitcoins then um, certainly you would be open to government regulation uh, money laundering regulation but the majority of these bitcoins are, have been created or gifted to the individuals who provide the hardware that run the network. So in fact it's not like central currency where uh, the treasury rings up uh, the mint and says print us another billion quid um, and we'll you know we'll distribute it. Here, here the, the bitcoins are mainly in the hands of private individuals and if you buy a Bitcoin off of uh, someone, like on local Bitcoins, it is a private transaction. And as such, there's no requirement to register it or there's no money laundering at all. Any more than if I said to you, Richard, I'm, I am going to Italy next week and I know you've got a couple of hundred euro from the last time you went abroad. Is it alright if I give you the money and we swap it over? There's no money laundering. And once the fiat currency is in the Bitcoin black hole if you like once it's gone into the Bitcoin universe it's totally invisible until it emerges again you know when somebody does pay uh, pay for something in the real world with it and then you might have a chance of catching 
the person who spent it and saying oh yeah so they were your bitcoins but um but hmrc is not actually all that uh, interested in expenditure are they they're only interested in income they're only interested in expenditure to the point that it's tax deductible whereas really all yeah. their efforts are concentrated on taxing income and uh, well, but if you're actually um, paying somebody for something then it means that they're receiving an income potentially yeah absolutely yeah and that's where they're going to have trouble and I yeah. think in in 10 years or 20 years time the tax tax will have to be far more based on tangible assets like property which you can't hide than uh, or business activity which again the, the Inland Revenue can walk into your shop and and you'll have your QR code there so they'll they'll say oh yeah this is your Bitcoin account we can see uh, we can see the activity on that account um, but then um, how are they what are they going to do they're going to turn around and say well we want to know uh, that we, we see the inputs we see you've had 200,000 pound of Bitcoin income fine which we, we'll we'll will tax you on that and then you have to then say what you've spent of the 200,000 out you know they're going to be they're going to need to be as interested in the out because if you've you could once you've got all that money in bitcoin you can then pay your gardener with it and then but he's he's going to have no worries at all about income tax because yeah. the, the, the transaction is not going to be shown as a, a, a PAYE transaction is it just going to be one bloke giving another bloke another some bitcoin <laughs> well that is actually illegal <laughs> yeah i know yeah yeah of course well, what, what you need to remember derek is um if anybody does some work they receive an income it doesn't matter if they receive it as a a pair of wellingtons a cash hmm. it can be a, a form of service like um a battering it could be bitcoins it still needs to be declared and the UK tax system is based around honesty you know you could have somebody that's got their own little business or big business that doesn't declare a penny of revenue they may never get found out by the revenue but that is actually illegal it's it's based on the individual to declare what they earn every year and then the revenue will say right based on your revenue this is what tax you're liable to pay and there's certain allowances that you don't uh, that, that will mean that you don't pay tax on certain uh, up to certain levels, depending on uh, if you're an individual or a company, etc. But if you earn it, you've got to pay tax, and it is actually a form of, of laundering money. But on the flip side, if you declare that you've you've uh, paid somebody a thousand pounds for for doing your gardening or your office gardening, let's say. So you'll still attract tax relief on that thousand pounds worth of work. It's up to the gardener to actually declare that thousand pounds worth of revenue. So it's it's as clean or dirty as, as the individual wants to make it. It's just another way of, of paying for services like a credit card or like cash or debit cards, etc. Bank account. So I think yeah, it's no, great no, I, I agree with you. No, no, I agree with you, and I'm not advocating tax avoidance. Well, I think the point I was trying to make is that this is going to be far less transparent, and that uh, you know it's not going to be. You know, in, in ways, it's extremely transparent because every transaction is open, but it's it's as though everybody had a Swiss bank account, a Swiss numbered bank account. Mm -hmm. And I applaud you yeah. for saying that it's the system is based on honesty, but it's based on honesty and the threat of extremely large sanctions, isn't it? Should you mm. fail to be anything less than honest. You know, you can the, the penalties that are charged are not they're big because I don't think the the inland revenue thinks that people are as honest as you do. Yeah. <laughs> they I don't, the they don't have the trust but... or the faith in the humanity that you do and people's <laughs> people's uh, uh keenness to pay taxes. So you can imagine if everybody had the benefit of uh, as the rich do of a numbered Swiss bank account. Uh, where, where you know, it, the, no amount of effort would trace the number to the person who was administering the money. Don't I mean that's going to have a big impact, isn't it, on uh, compliance? I think. Yeah, of course. I mean, the the, the the 
the UK government a few years ago brought in an amnesty against people with offshore bank accounts and, and that obviously brought a lot of money in, back into the UK because people didn't want to go to jail mm. and you can still open a bank account in certain parts of the world, I won't mention it, but I'm sure you can Google go it, um, go with an on, account mention it. set up as Mickey Mouse. Let me no, just, uh, I'll, I'll mention a few and you just blink if I get one of the right ones. Take, I'm not going to, my eyes are closed. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just go through a few. Cayman Islands? <laughs> I'm not going to go there. That was a blink. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to now. Anyway, we're, we're doing a big thing on it and the fusion, so uh, if anyone wants to hear it all again, or at least... Uh, read it all in a, in a more sort of coherent fashion then um, uh, that's going to be one of the big features and I think we are this month we're doing um, the theme of the magazine is um, um, uh, charging privately in addition to um, charging on the NHS and whether um, patients should have a, a freedom to pay a bit extra if they want something just a bit over and above the NHS uh, Whereas um, when I think at the moment what their um, their options are either to stick with the NHS in all its loveliness or go private completely but not mix the two and um, you know a lot of dentists think that that's a bit that's a bit daft because a lot of patients could stay on the NHS and let's face it they all have to pay national insurance so why shouldn't they get something back uh, and in other areas like social care um, the personal budgets are being encouraged um, so that for example um, if you have a, a social budget then the council will be dead keen for you to take control of it and spend it and say where you want to put it um, whereas in health um, any idea that you should be entitled to any say in where you're treated or you know, how, how the money that you're entitled to should be spent as soon as you start to say yeah I'd like to uh, put it towards this or that you're you're literally told well that's you you're not on the health service anymore you know you, we're, we're going to chuck you out so that's a first of february so uh, now anyone who's got bitcoins and there's an awful lot of people out there who've got bitcoins who don't know what to do with them at the moment because you can't spend them anywhere uh we go to our website and give us whatever you think the association's worth if you think the podcasts are worth something anything even 10p <laughs> you can you can pay us 10p now it's not a problem just go to the website get our uh, bitcoin address and send us a point zero 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 one of a bitcoin or something and uh, it all adds up and if you want to see if anyone has done you can do what i said paste our address in the blockchain info and then uh, and see how it's going so have i convinced anyone chris i don't think you're going to be getting any are you no, I think it will remain a, a niche thing. I don't think it will ever be adopted on uh, the scale that it would have to be to make any kind of big impact. I think your man on the street, your lady on the street, is just not going to get their head around this. It's too tricky for the for the general public to grasp. Yeah, I think but in this country like you. you're, you're probably. I know. I think in this country so you're probably right. Up your street. In America, I think you're probably right. I think if you would go to Argentina, <laughs> where they have forty percent inflation, and the the you know the, all of their life savings is depreciating forty percent every year because they've got a currency that's just uh, in free fall, then they don't. You don't have to spend all this time convincing them, but they, they can see, they can see it straight away. You know. Their only problem is yeah, where, where, where to get it from and where they can spend it and stuff. But no, I agree, you're right. Yeah, Probably and I, did, I think, in this country. I think, yeah, I think governments as well will get involved, but not in a positive way. I think they'll try to shut it down. They'll get HMRC on the case, and it will become just like any other uh, system of currency. I think they will do their best to shut it down once it looks like it's going to threaten them mm. but as you say there's only 21 million bitcoins around and that's not a great deal is it well it is it is when you consider they can all be divided up to eight decimal places 
So it's 21 times yeah, but it's 10 million, isn't it? 121 times 10. It's a drop in the ocean. It's 2.1 trillion or something. It's not... I mean, it, you could see perhaps the GDC spending 26 million quid on bitcoins. <laughs> but they, if they had done, they'd have 27 million quid in the time it's taken us to do this podcast. Yeah, exactly. There you go. You're listening, Gil Vary. Are you, Richard, do you think you're going to be uh, uh, advising people and you think you're going to have to add bitcoins to your portfolio of advice? Uh, of course we will. You know, we've got to embrace it, any change, and I, I don't think it's it's going to disappear. I think it's uh, it's going to be the, the way forward. It's so easy, especially with so many currencies around the world, if you can just have one international currency to purchase a holiday or a pair of wellies or... Yeah. whatever it may be, yeah. a house even, then it means that you don't get uh, get taken advantage of with all the exchange costs. I mean, I've got properties overseas and whenever I transfer funds to the euro, I always lose from the, the bid and offer spread. Yeah. It's just how it is. You, you can actually save quite a substantial sum of money by just having one international currency. Yeah, so if you needed anything doing like a decorating done abroad if you could pay the builder in bitcoins exactly yeah uh, there'll be no conversion costs and no um, transaction costs that's right and so, all the revenue from overseas as well could go into a bitcoin account um, so it's retained in your wallet yeah and which means it could be spent in pounds in the UK exactly the, and the fact as I say it's deflationary which I think is great if I let me show you mm. I put a um, hundred pounds on my um, well the phone's turned off now but I put a hundred pounds in bitcoins on my phone just to have a quick experiment and see you know how um, incidentally it doesn't work on iPhones and th there are no Bitcoin wallet applications for iPhones and the reason for that is Apple is about to bring out its own currency <laughs> seriously because you cool. know yeah well Google brought out its own currency uh, Disney World has Disney dollars doesn't it the London Underground has its has Oyster cards, yeah. uh, and Apple is about to bring out Apple Pips or something, and uh, they don't want um, uh, they don't want Bitcoin to catch on. It sort of caught them out a bit, you know. It's ca caught them on the hop a bit because they were about to bring out the, and um, yeah, I think Amazon Amazon does uh, its own currency because you can buy Amazon some things wherever they are, and if you buy a hundred pounds worth, you get a ten percent discount. So you can get you can spend ninety pounds, get a hundred pounds worth of what effectively they they gift vouchers, aren't they? Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then spend them on Amazon, and so effectively you're getting a ten percent discount. But you've got to buy it from. That's the thing. The, yeah, the, 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 bigger any of these. Yeah, and the trouble is that they're tied to Amazon, so they're basically in the same way as the pound is the currency of the British government. The Amazon currency is the currency of Amazon, and uh, Oyster cards are the currency of the London Underground. So um, mm. you, you don't um, you, you you're limited to that one supplier. And I, I imagine with Apple that will be exactly the same, that you can, yes, you can upgrade your iPhone or your iPad or whatever bit of kit you need or software, but apart from that, you can't go to Dell and buy a, a PC or a laptop from them. It's a closed currency. Well, um, in a, I think, to, oh, I don't want to go on, to, but, you know, I could go and talk about this for about five, five hours, but um, I think this year is going to be the year where we're going to see a, a lot of um, corporate interest in Bitcoin because it's the capital is capitalized now to the extent of about 10 billion pounds so and that's you know that's quite a reasonably large corporation so I think the other corporations are going to start to look at it from a demographic point of view and also I think that uh, the the number of um, retailers and small businesses accepting Bitcoin is going to explode because to be quite honest with you it's cheaper to price your goods in Bitcoin and build up your Bitcoin stash that way than it is to literally buy them using money where, you, where you're paying your 10 percent but I'll tell you in closing I'll tell you the best thing for me right the one thing that I love every morning I get up and I look at this I put a hundred pounds on my um, co uh, phone and uh, in showing my brother-in-law how the transferring system worked I transferred 20 quid to my PC 
which left me with eighty pounds on the phone and every morning I get up and I have a look at the balance I don't know if you can see the balance there yeah it's probably a bit out of focus but I've got about point zero zero point two of a Bitcoin still on it which is what I've left on there um, and the value of that is, is hundred and twenty four pounds you can you probably can't see that so they make forty pounds uh, yeah so so that eighty pounds that I had left on my phone um, after I'd done the transfer went up to 90 then it went up to 100 then it went up to 106 or something and now it's up to 124 this is, this is literally I'm getting richer as we speak <laughs> I, am, I am getting more wealthy as we speak and the idea is you can put I mean you could put 100 pounds on your phone go out have a meal for 20 quid and next week you've got it back again <laughs> that's deflationary currency for you that's and we just we've never had that in this you know we're always used to our money being worth less but once you get into deflationary currencies there there's a bit of magic about them anyway that's it Bitcoin hard sell over I do own a few I don't have an interest in the system nobody does nobody's gonna make any money out of the system okay. in the mines yeah apart from the miners but it's technically it's so hard to mine bitcoins now the difficulty's shot up so much that uh, unless you've got a specialized piece of kit you're not going to make any coins um, you know the, um, the 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 clever money now in bitcoins is not necessarily in mining big money's in mining but clever money is in um, either speculation which is a very very high risk in the value or in just um, in just using them to do clever things that save you money mm. right I think we'll wind up there okay. I'm gonna have to cut a load a big chunk out of this because this has gone on yeah now and a quarter more than that probably there yeah. is quite a lot to cut out of me whinging about feedback which I'm still getting by the way yeah I'm sorry about that I'll um now I know that the uh, Google things working I'll um I'll uh, re I'll pull a few plugs and push a few things in holes, and see if I can't <laughs> sort it out. We were, and there was about half an hour of crap at the beginning, wasn't there? Yeah, we'll get yeah. there. We'll get there. Oh, yeah. But so, anyway, yeah. Anyway, to our, our five viewers, I like to say cheerio. The good thing about the Google is that at least it coordinates the sound with the video, whereas before I recorded the video separately and the audio, and I had to try and put the two together, and that was always a nightmare. Whereas at least However, this this way, um, probably the audio is not quite as good and the video is not quite as good. But um, uh, it's going to cut it's going to cut the editing down from four hours to about half an hour. It's not it's not syncing though with uh, with your mouth the sound. That's the problem. No, it maybe no. it maybe do, will do on your system, but on our on mine, it, it, there's a delay. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It was nothing like the horrendous uh, problems we had before, though. It's like anyway. an Eddie, Eddie Murphy moment. <laughs> 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 right, guys. Nice to see you. Yeah. Cheers, Thank chaps. You. I'll see you again, perhaps in uh, three weeks. Will be towards the end of January, so we might have a little bit more to report then. Brilliant. Yeah. And, and in uh, the meantime. Let's see if the GDC spends 26 million quid on bitcoins. <laughs> it wouldn't do the price any harm. Au revoir. <laughs> okay, bye. 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 bye.